the date today is June 27th, 2011, and I am in the office of the National Women's Law Center with Marsha Greenberger, founder and co-president. And Marsha has agreed to sit down and talk to me about her, her life and Jewish background. So thank you very much, Marsha. I'm very uh, honored to be discussing it with you. Thank you. So let's start at the beginning and talk a little bit, if you would, about your early years, where you grew up, and what kind of Jewish observance there was in your family. Well, I grew up in Philadelphia. Both my parents uh, are or were Jewish. My father is um, died a number of years ago. My mother at 96 is still alive. Mm -hmm. And being Jewish was always a very important part of our identity and our culture and just who I thought of myself as. I did uh, grow up in a neighborhood where there were many, many other Jewish families, and so growing up through school and the like, there were always a lot of Jewish kids. So you did, you, did you feel like a minority? <clears throat> well, ironically enough, I didn't feel like as much of a minority as um, obviously Jews are both in Philadelphia, let alone in other parts of the country, let alone in the world, I had a very distorted view of the fact that I thought that being Jewish was probably what the majority of kids were when I was younger. So no, no Christmas pageant at school? There were. Uh -huh. There were all of those Christmas celebrations, and also when I went to public school, you had to read from the New Testament and the Old Testament. They were alternated. Um, reading passages when the day began. So we read from the Bible when the day began every day. But somehow that never seeped in as something that reflected either inappropriately about why is are we reading from the Bible at all in a public school, let alone why we would be reading from the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, I did, so the, the notion of separation of church and state never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is there were always kids who weren't Jewish. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the, we read from the New Testament, I probably thought, now that I'm thinking about this for the first time with you asking me, as isn't that ecumenical of us all that we're incorporating everybody's part of the Bible. It didn't make me feel as if it, I was a particular minority. Now, I certainly knew that the world at large celebrated Christmas and that we had a celebration of sorts, but not really uh, celebrating Christmas. And we certainly celebrated Hanukkah. But, so I knew that but I somehow didn't incorporate it into my identity as being a minority mm -hmm. until I became older. Mm -hmm. And did you have Jewish education? I did. Uh, I went, but my family, my parents belonged to a synagogue. I went to Hebrew school and Sunday school three days a week. And had I done what they expected, I would have also gone to services on Saturday, which is a general matter. I did not do, and my family did not do, except for high holiday services. Did you have a bat mitzvah? I had a bat mitzvah. I was one of three girls who did on a Friday night. We were not allowed. I, I grew up with it, going to a conservative mm -hmm. synagogue. We were not allowed to read from the Torah, but bat mitzvah for girls was just in its beginning phases. So three of us were bat mitzvah together. We read on a Friday night from the Haft Torah. Do you remember thinking at that time, gee, this is different from what the boys are doing? Yes, but it didn't, as you can, you'll see, that didn't say, oh, well, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that sense of it. I just thought, oh, well, I get to do a bat mitzvah. That's something that's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, continued on until I was confirmed when I was 16. I must admit that I did not want to continue on. I hated Hebrew school. And I never really, despite all those years, became fluent reading, let alone understanding Hebrew. 
and I never, except for understanding some of the stories of the Bible and that Jews don't believe in Jesus, ever got much of a grounding about the philosophy mm -hmm. or the ethics of the Jewish religion per se in Hebrew school. But you came out of this with but a, a Jewish identity. I certainly came out of it very much feeling as if I was Jewish, feeling very comfortable in a synagogue, comfortable with other Jews, comfortable with Jewish traditions, comfortable expecting to celebrate Passover and Hanukkah and the high holiday services. Um, that was all a very central part of my growing up. And um, I certainly also felt as if I could walk into a synagogue, probably anywhere, and feel a certain basic level of comfort. If you were to reflect on uh, Jewish values that may have been transmitted to you in your home, what would you say that they would be? Well, you know, now as an adult and as I became more sophisticated in college, I took some classes on religions, of different religions, so that I had a little bit of a context to understand what the ethical teachings were of the Jewish religion and um, made conscious choices in starting my own family. And my husband also is Jewish and had grown up in an even more religious, conservative uh, tradition than I had. But we opted for a variety of reasons to belong to Reformed Jewish synagogue. Mm -hmm. And our two daughters were bat mitzvahed and continued on, and both married Jewish men, and both were married by our rabbi, et cetera. And so our whole family has really thinks of itself mm -hmm. as Jewish. I have two sisters, and they also married Jewish men mm -hmm. and stayed in uh, the religion belonging to the synagogue, et cetera. Um, I think that for me, in terms of the ethics and the principles of the Jewish religion, they're very entwined in the uh, the principles of how you live your life as an individual with respect to your community and the world at large. And to be more specific, I think that there were progressive values that were very much at the core of my parents' um, view of the world that they didn't always link very explicitly to what it means to be Jewish, that you need to be progressive mm -hmm. <laughs> if you are Jewish, but which I view as being in sync. So mm -hmm. that caring about the poor, caring about uh, the um, least of us, having a sense of integrity in how you conduct your everyday affairs, uh, caring about family, caring about tradition, caring about the Jewish religion, and carrying on a sense of identity about being Jewish and a responsibility that that means towards the Jewish community that you have and also Israel. These are all very much fundamental mm -hmm. to, I think, my general um, selection of a mate, mm -hmm. of a career. Mm -hmm the way I've raised my children, and um, I, those are principles as I, I feel, as I have worked now uh, in the women's rights movement that I have felt are very much aligned with my Jewish religion and the values that I grew up with, mm -hmm. and I feel extremely comfortable in the Jewish religion in especially the reform movement that I'm a part of, and also um, very proud of that religious tradition. So I cannot say for every type of Judaism I feel that same mm -hmm. identity, but I do certainly for reform Jews and for many others who aren't mm -hmm. reformed. Okay. Um, 
Do, do your children have the same sense of identity? Definitely. Mm -hmm. My older daughter um, actually spent a junior semester abroad in Israel. Now, I cannot say that any of us are very, should I say, religious and going to services every week or having Shabbat dinners mm -hmm. every week, but um, they feel strongly about going to services during the high holiday services. Uh, high holiday period, they all light candles during Hanukkah. Um, they have a sense that very much of a sense of community and that they are Jews. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, um, they, uh, all right, let's, let's move on to, to college. Uh, I know you went to the University of Pennsylvania. Right. When you entered, did you have ex an expectation of a career? Uh, well, when I entered, I thought that I would certainly prepare myself for some career. My family was supportive of teaching, which was a very common thing for women of my generation to do if they went to college on the theory that it could accommodate family responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and it certainly was primarily women who were teaching. They weren't thinking teaching at a post high school level, they were thinking about teaching at an elementary secondary level. Mm -hmm. uh, I was open to whether there was something else that I might do at the University of Pennsylvania. They did not offer degrees in education. I would not have wanted to get a degree in education anyway, but you could take extra courses in education that didn't count towards your degree, but that you could have so that if you Worse, you could be eligible to be certified mm -hmm. as a secondary school teacher in Philadelphia public schools. And that is what I did. I went to summer school, took those extra courses, and actually then took the exam to be certified as a history teacher, which was my major, mm -hmm. so that but I would be able to teach. somewhere along the way. But somewhere along the way, partially I went to a girls' high school, which was very much focused on what, you know, women, expecting women to have careers. Now, becoming a nurse or a teacher fit quite comfortably into those expectations. Mm -hmm. Many people in my high school class chose those professions. But there was never any expectation or at all that you wouldn't have some career. It was an all academic, all city girls school, high school. Uh, when I went to college, that was really the first time I was confronted with the fact that actually, even though the University of Pennsylvania had a relatively large number of Jewish students as universities go, we were very much of a minority in that university. And I focused for the first time on the fact that there were sororities and fraternities that had a lot of status where Jews weren't allowed. And there were fancy camps that kids had gone to which weren't for Jews, and that there were clubs that Jews weren't allowed to, were really welcome to join, and if they did, it was the exception rather than the rule. That was all very new to me in college. So what were you thinking? Well, I remember thinking a couple things. First of all, on an intellectual plane, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the Christmas notion and the, the, the feeling of really, I am a minority in this country, and it's a minority that's also not really part of the elite and the ruling class and the people with power and that there were law firms in Philadelphia at that time, though I didn't know that until I went to law school, but that there would be law, law firms and the like where Jews were not welcome. Mm -hmm. That was all a dawning realization and the more it dawned as I went through college and then continuing on in law school, the more I felt grieved about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
those lines were beginning to break down during my generation. So I can't say that I felt probably as personally disadvantaged by being Jewish during that period as I did being a woman. Mm -hmm. But the combination of being mm -hmm. a Jewish woman sure wasn't great, mm -hmm. especially in the world of law firms in Philadelphia at the time. I did evolve with respect to a career, and at first what I thought I would really love to do, because I just love, love college, was to become a history professor at the college level and get a PhD. So that my, as my career aspirations were enhanced going along, but I was still thinking in a teaching mode, but a college teaching mode. And I ended up really not until my senior year in college thinking about becoming, going to law school. And I did that for several reasons. Probably I must admit one very important reason was that I had two girlfriends who were bound and determined to go to law school and they said, I should think about that too. Mm -hmm. And so I had company and some real peer um, support. A second thing is that the chair of the history department, who was also my advisor, and who I had an honors history seminar with my senior year, and who I was gonna have to rely upon for help getting into graduate program in history, was very discouraging of my going. Because he said I was the best student in the history department at the time, which was very wonderful, but getting a PhD is long, it's rigorous. By the time you get the dissertation, it could take seven years. I'd be married, I'd have kids, I'd never make it through the seven years. Then I'd end up with a master's degree, not a PhD. You can't teach in college with a master's degree, so I'd end up teaching in high school history anyway. So without having to have gone through that whole exercise, without anything to show for it at the end of the day. That didn't sound crazy to me. Mm -hmm. I did apply to history graduate programs. I wasn't sure how much of a supportive reference he was gonna be, since he was so discouraging of my going, at least that's how I heard it. Sure. Uh, but I did get accepted and I did get financial aid, which was very central and important. But at the same time I applied, to law school, I got more financial aid. Mm -hmm. And this advice was sort of going around in my head, well, law school's three years, not seven years. There's no dissertation. You can go in, you take exams, so maybe the worst that can happen is you don't do that well in your exam, but you're gonna end up with a degree, as opposed to a PhD. If you don't write that dissertation, you're not getting any, the degree either. So that seemed very practical to me, uh, that maybe I could, although three years seemed like a long time, mm -hmm. I could actually make it through and get a law degree. And then looking back, and I don't know how much I would ascribe this to the Jewish religion per se, as opposed to the Jewish values and the progressive intertwining of all of those things, I grew up in the 50s with my parents. You know, I would come home from school, the McCarthy hearings were on TV. We always discussed public policy, Medicare, Medicaid coming in, the Johnson administration. And during the Kennedy administration, when I was in high school, I was just mesmerized by the Kennedys. It was glamorous. They were doing important things that had resonated with me based on my growing up. I have an older sister and I remember her talking about, it was sort of like talking about becoming Miss America. Talking about, oh, going to Washington and working for an administration like the Kennedy administration. E either of those things was equally more of a fantasy than a true plan. But it was in my mind. Were you being influenced by the feminist movement? <clears throat> Not directly, uh, and although it, my consciousness was being raised slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. So certainly not at the bot mitzvah stage. When I went to college, Penn had a college for women and then a college. So you were accepted as a woman to the College for Women 
there were a third of the number of students in the college for women. So it was much harder to get mm -hmm. into. I don't think I focused on that particularly till I got there. And at first, the women were all banding together. Isn't it great we're so much smarter than the guys? As opposed to, this is very unfair. The, yeah, I'm sorry. The women had separate curfews that the guys didn't have. You could be actually um, kicked out of school if you came in late repeatedly on these curfews. And it was very angering to think that these freshman guys would have no curfew and a senior woman could end up with a curfew and in trouble. That was very unfair. Mm -hmm. We had to wear skirts to classes and skirts even on the weekends to the library up until my senior year when you were allowed to wear skirts to the library on Sunday afternoon. That, those kinds of things were starting to rankle. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I applied to law school with these two girlfriends, we went to take the LSATs, and these guys came over and started screaming at us, we shouldn't take the LSATs, we don't belong in law school. At the time, the Vietnam War was raging, and um, graduate school, if you were in graduate school, you could get a deferment from the draft. So many guys at the time saw a seat in law school as a way of avoiding the Vietnam War. And if a woman was sitting in mm -hmm. that seat, that was one more person who was going to get drafted. So did you have role models in, in, in law school? I mean, were there women mentoring these female students? Uh, no. In law school, when we started, there we were 10 women, including one of those two young women who was a very close friend of mine. We both started together. And our class was about 240. So there were 10 women out of 240. We were e viewed either suspiciously as, why are you in law school to begin with? Is it to get married and find somebody to marry? Is there something weird about you? Or what is it? So how, you know, how did you respond to that? To, to be um, that really very be visible very In a very defensive yeah. way, plus um, law school first year is intimidating anyway, with law professors in those days calling on people using the Socratic method where they would ask question after question after question and ultimately get to a question you probably couldn't answer. And I remember starting law school, raising my hand to be called on, and there were big lecture classes then. There were not small classes, so you were in a class of about 100 years with your whole section. And after about three weeks, and I hadn't been called on in the beginning, but seeing the other male students getting demolished, I decided I was never volunteering mm -hmm. the rest of law school. So. There was a feeling of intimidation to start with just being in law school. That was already a shock because I was very comfortable and loved college. And now all of a sudden I was feeling very out of my element. I didn't think the way those law professors mm -hmm. did. And so that was intimidating. And there was also a male dorm. And a lot of the first year male students were all in the dorm for the law school. There was no dorm for women. So I was sharing an apartment in Center City with this law school friend of mine from college and another friend, another female friend. So I was not part of the social scene mm -hmm. where I could be easily become a pal with the other guys in the class. Mm -hmm. And there was this hostility starting with the LSATs. I had gone to visit a class, a law school class, when I was in my senior year at Penn to see what I thought of a law school class, and a law professor saw, saw me sitting in the back of the class, and I just thought, it's a class of about 100 that I could just easily sit there. I didn't know the protocol was to introduce myself and ask him ahead of time if it was okay, if I could be there. So I just slipped in, and he started calling on me. Mm -hmm. And the whole class, Miss Visitor, mm -hmm. which I remember mm -hmm. to this day, mm -hmm. is calling me, and the whole class is in hysterics, because of course he demolished me right. within 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. But I, so I, I started out with a, a bit of a, a sense of 
people not welcoming me to begin with and that I was an oddity, any, at, at the best I was an oddity. And then feeling especially insecure just being in law school. Mm -hmm. And also people feeling very competitive with each other and feeling as if I, I just didn't know whether I was going to be able to truly cut it. Yeah. So when you fold all these things mm -hmm. together, then I was really starting to feel discrimination mm -hmm. on the basis of sex. I encountered at that point a number of law firms that would not accept women at all and said so. Mm -hmm. They explicitly said they wouldn't hire women. I interviewed at one Washington law firm that told me, the, a partner told me, that they had never had a woman associate and he didn't see how they ever would because Washington is not a safe city and you know the lawyers work very late at night and what, they can't have a woman, a young woman lawyer working very late at night. What if she's leaving and something terrible happens? They'd never, they'd never be able to come to grips with that. And I, to this day, I walked out and it occurred to me in the hallway, what about all the secretaries who were staying late but I never marched myself back into the office to say, wait a minute, I'll take whatever security that you give to the secretaries. Mm -hmm. But that was a prevailing mm -hmm. attitude. Mm -hmm. So through, and when I was in law school, the women were called on for the rape cases and the cases that, where they were going to be embarrassed and in very stereotypical ways, and that happened Did you ever in my think, class. What have I gotten myself into? I sh should have gone back to history. Well, I'd already had a feeling that I wasn't going to be necessarily so welcomed in history mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. I had some very good friends. And the longer, actually one of the jokes, because my husband was in my law school class, we met there. Not till the end of our first year, but did we really get to know each other well. But um, I was called on... <clears throat> relatively early on by a very elderly, very traditional law school professor in a torts class asking me about some malfunction of an airplane. It was very mechanical. I felt out of my element altogether. And he was pressing me and I couldn't answer it and he kept asking me question after question and I kept not answering them correctly. And he said, try again, try again. So I, by the fourth time, I said, well, I'm going to try this time, but if I don't get it right, you better call in somebody else because I don't think I have the right answer. So I sort of stood up for myself a little bit. Uh -huh. And after it was over, all these guys came over, don't feel bad, this, you know, you were funny, that was great, you told them not, you know, told them not to call on you anymore, <laughs> not to, you obviously didn't know. So that kind of broke the ice mm -hmm. a little bit. So I had, that helped me, I always joked too, that they thought, ah, oh, this woman is no threat mm -hmm. <laughs> after that one. <laughs> but I had ended up um, with more and more friends, mm -hmm. both male and female. The women bonded together as you could imagine, mm -hmm. and there were great women in my class, a lot of very good guys in my class, and I got more and more of the hang of law school, and I ended up being a good enough student that I was beginning to feel as if, first of all, I could do it, and secondly, I wasn't going to be penalized in my grades or in a way that, so that I could actually make it through. Did you feel like a pioneer at the time? I guess I would began to think in those terms, but I was I so much had my head down in a survival mode and in a having to defend myself mode that I'm not sure I stepped back enough to think, you know, this is really going to be important for other women too after me. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, oh well, certainly I in mean, retrospect, I think change in our whole generation. Mm -hmm was affected that way. What happened too is our first year graduate school deferments were taken away in the fall. So our class was completely discombobulated because many of the guys were going to be drafted and had to figure out how they could stay in law school 
or what they were going to do mm -hmm. about the draft. And so our class went from 240 to about 110. So in a certain sense, there was being a woman, you were a pioneer, mm -hmm. but you were also advantaged because you personally were not going to have your whole life turned upside down mm -hmm. in quite the same way. And right after us is when the wave of women started. Mm -hmm. So class after class had many more women. Our class was in a certain sense really the last mm -hmm. class of so few women. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at the time, this was in the, in the, the 60s. Late 60s, late 60s, I graduated from law school in 1970. So there were all these other things going on in the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-War Movement, right. the ERA was getting thought about. I, I, I probably thought about, earlier, not much you know. discussed, but. Yeah. yeah, so do you see your career as fitting into this Absolutely. The whole time? Totally. Absolutely. I was very much of an activist in law school and in college. In college, we had sit-ins that I participated in. Uh, and while many historians have pointed to this period of turmoil and as spawning the women's movement because women who were activists were also in second-class positions in all these civil rights and peace mm -hmm. organizations. I wasn't thinking, I wasn't aspiring to be in a leadership role for any of them, and so I, I, pro I don't think I even know, I, I know I didn't notice that there weren't women necessarily running any of them. I, I wasn't thinking why would like you? that. But um, certainly the idea that you can change things. Mm -hmm that you can speak up, that you have the power and the responsibility to do it, that the older generation in power can make dreadful and terrible decisions, and that you just shouldn't sit back and accept the status quo. Mm -hmm. That was very central mm -hmm. to my way of thinking. And um, so ultimately, as I evolved and began to see in my own life what it meant to try to take on a more equal role mm -hmm. and to see the disparities just so starkly in front of us that the idea that you could do something about it, mm -hmm. that, became, that was a natural next step to make. So my husband and I were married in law school and another thing was that clerking for a judge was a prestigious and good thing to do after law school, there were many, many, many federal judges who would not accept women law clerks at the time. And the faculty said to me, even though I had a good record, most of the male federal judges wouldn't accept women clerks. Um, we decided to come to Washington. My husband had a clerkship, and I went to a tax firm. I did work for a law firm. Um, in my third year and started in the tax department and liked it and stayed there. You asked me where their role models. Well, that tax firm, my third year, there was, I had never, by the way, growing up, knew many lawyers at all, male, let alone female. And I can't, when I say many, honestly, I can't, I, I probably had met some met lawyers my parents must have known, but I can't remember any of them. They certainly weren't good friends to start with. And um, when I was in college, I never had a female professor as a history major at the University of Pennsylvania. There was one woman who was a graduate student who, in history who taught some of the breakout sections mm -hmm. from the big lecture class. And I remember being intrigued by her because she was young and vibrant and attractive and she looked like she was on a path to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. But that was as close as I came to a woman professor teaching me as a liberal arts major. Now that, of course, there were women on the faculty at Penn and there was a college for women, so there were administrative staff that were women. But they were so much of a minority that I wouldn't say I really saw much of a role model except for that one young woman mm -hmm. or any woman who was a mentor. When I went to law school, 
for a short time there was one woman on the faculty who I never really knew and then she left. Uh, so she wasn't there for all three years, otherwise it was all male and I never had a woman law professor either. So through my seven years of school I never had a woman professor. And this is in Pennsylvania, not a backwater state and the University of Pennsylvania, not a backwater institution. Um, when I worked in that law firm my third year, there was a woman who actually was also a Jewish woman who was at that law firm. She had a special status. I didn't know at the time what it was. We probably would call it of counsel now. She was not on a partnership track. And she had not mar ever married. The law firm that I worked at was an old, what they call white shoe firm that had very, very few Jews, mm -hmm. Jewish lawyers to start with. And the Jewish lawyers they had were younger. So I got to know in law school that there were Jewish firms and there were the WASP firms. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish firms were, could be successful, but they weren't as integrated into the power structure of Philadelphia. And then I, I learned about the main line area of Philadelphia where Jews were not welcome and the clubs the Jews couldn't belong to. That all, I really got the concreteness of it even more in a professional setting in law school. Mm -hmm. um, so this one woman was lovely. I, I liked her very much. I wouldn't say she was a mentor of mine uh, and not particularly a role model either because I didn't wasn't wild about the fact that she was off in the special status. She didn't have a family. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. just, it, but she was a woman lawyer, and so I remember her very much. That there was such a thing. Do you see yourself now as a role model? Uh, I guess I must be. I don't think of myself explicitly that way, but I I know that I certainly are probably less of a role model than a unique role model now than I may have been in earlier years. But on the other hand, I think I'm a role model still in less as a successful woman lawyer because I think certainly women can find other successful women mm -hmm. lawyers in lots of walks of life um, to look to. But even more today, I think, than ever, the idea of can you have a career, can you be married, can you have children, mm -hmm. that set of questions is of burning interest and concern and worry mm -hmm. for young women today. Mm -hmm. What well, was it not for you? Well, when I first started, it was, but I, I think First of all, institutions for men and women were very different than they are today. If you went to a law firm and you were a man and you were successful, you could assume that's where you would be your whole career. Mm -hmm. What it meant to devote yourself to a law firm in Washington, now New York City may be different, but Washington was, you worked hard, mm -hmm. but you did not work every minute of the day billing hours. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that um, you didn't have to be very focused on your career, but it was not as all-consuming and as insecure as it is today. So the, the notion of what it means to be successful, I think, has ramped up. And the sacrifices expected of both men and women have changed dramatically you, since I started. Could you talk about your, your own work family balance situation when your girls were young? Well, when I, um, I, I should say a couple things. First of all, my husband was always very supportive. We had met as colleagues in law school. Same class, same experiences. And at the time, I was just barely 23 when I got married. He was six months older, so he was an older man. He was 23, too, which was not all, that wasn't young to get married at that time. 
Um, now, of course, I think it was very young, but it gave us time for each of us to start a work life. And so we were married for five years before my first, our first child, my daughter, first daughter was born. By then, I had moved from this tax firm to a public interest organization, the Center for Law and Social Policy, one of the first in the country, chaired by Arthur Goldberg, talk about a mentor and the most extraordinary Jewish light in many respects and certainly in the law, having been a justice on the Supreme Court. And he came and worked in my tax firm and had associates working for him. And he chaired the board of the Center for Law and Social Policy. So he was very much a reason why I came to the center to see, uh, to start a women's rights project there. Can I ask what you remember about him? Oh, I remember a lot about him. Um, gosh, that could, that's a whole other topic, but he was a feminist in every, to his being in every way, shape, and form. First of all, he was, took me as seriously as any of the associates who worked for him. And he worked with me in improving my skills as a lawyer. And he treated me with enormous respect. Mm -hmm. Secondly, at the same time that we had this, I had this extraordinary professional mentor, he was enormously kind, big-hearted individual who cared about people as people. And so he cared about what I was going to do and what my husband was going to do and was I going to have children. Mm -hmm. And he was so um, both in love and admiring of his wife, Dorothy, who he talked about all the time. And his family life was so central to him. He was such a complete person in mm -hmm. so many respects mm -hmm. that he, he was just terrific. Anyway, when I, so I partially, because of him, came to start the Women's Rights Project at the center. He was, as the chair of the board of the center, extraordinarily supportive of its women's rights work and when we reached a point where becoming an independent organization made the most sense and we became the National Women's Law Center, he was right behind it, totally behind it. And it's extraordinary. He was just fantastic. Yeah. And he um, invited me to events where he gave speeches. He, I have some memorabilia in my office today that he gave me from the, his time at the Supreme Court, from a speech that he gave in Israel and they gave him a gift that he couldn't, at a bank of Israel that he couldn't accept and he gave it to the National Women's Law Center. He, he's just so supportive of the issues. The Cosmos Club, a private club in Washington mm -hmm. that selects people based on merit and if you are really um, a great success in your field, whatever mm -hmm. your field may be, refused to accept women for many, many years. And he was one of the members of that club, among other private clubs in Washington, who worked very hard to change the admissions mm -hmm. to allow women to join when they, he, he failed for a time, although now they do accept women, he left the club. Mm -hmm. So. He, I mean, he an exceptional human he being. He was a wonderful person mm -hmm. and mentor. Mm -hmm. When I came to the center to start women's rights, there was a woman, Pat Wald, Patricia Wald, who was there. And that was the really first true role model woman that I saw as a lawyer. She was brilliant, had graduated from Yale Law School, was the first in her class. I mean, uh, first in her family, rather, to have ever graduated from college, let alone law school. She'd gone to a law firm. She married, 
a wonderful Jewish man, actually, in her class, Bob Wald. Her name was Patricia McGowan Wald. And they had five children. She took time off from her career with those children, as she describes it. But she always kept her hand in doing projects of one sort or another while she had the primary responsibility for raising those five kids. And one of the things she did was work at the Center for Law and Social Policy on mental health and other issues. Mm -hmm. So she was there when I started. Mm -hmm. And she was so extraordinary in every way, a superb lawyer, five kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was never anything I was thinking in terms of balancing work and family. Um, and ultimately, she went on to do many things, including being the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit. Mm -hmm. So my serving as a role model, I was so much thinking, who are my role models and mentors, that to kind of shift in your head from being a young person learning the ropes to a person that other people are looking up to, that mm -hmm. took some time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but over the years, I certainly have been asked to speak to many people, both in my professional capacity, just on the issues, but then also to many, many forums about having a career, how do you balance it with family responsibilities. You asked me about how we did it, and my husband ended up while I had this public interest career, not earning a whole lot of money, he ended up in a private firm. So we were very, very lucky because I both had a base of time mm -hmm. to establish some professional credentials and connections, including hitting the jackpot with Arthur Goldberg. Um, and then we had these resources. Child care centers did not exist mm -hmm. in those early mm -hmm. days. So we did have uh, a nanny, a full-time nanny at home, and that I had through my children's growing up. They started school, of course, but uh, I had that help. Um, so I, that's not very common that people can do these days, but we were able to do it. and. For a time, I worked four days a week. And my colleague, Nancy Duff Campbell, became the co-head of the National Women's Law Center. And we both had young children. And part of the reason we wanted to have this sharing arrangement was so that we could both keep, not neither would have only administrative and fundraising responsibilities that we could each keep our hand in the substantive work mm -hmm. and share those administrative types of duties mm -hmm. and also so that we could spell each other. Mm -hmm. If something happened, we didn't have to feel as if the whole institution was looking and to only one person. Mm -hmm. And that's a relationship that has stood us in good stead over now decades. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still co-presidents of the center, and now each grandparents. Mm -hmm. So it's as there have been many different cycles in life. Are, are you um, surprised at the success of the women's movement? I'm not surprised at the success. I have to keep reminding myself of the successes, and they have been really extraordinary. Because I think when I started, I never expected that it would be as hard as it was, and has been, and continues to be, mm -hmm. both to secure those successes and to build on them. And I honestly don't think any success is accepted you know, as, as permanent if there isn't continued uh, public support and there are always going to be battles that have to be refought and uh, re-won. So I think I w neither understood fully 
the women's movement when I started, mm -hmm. nor did I get have history major or not enough of a grasp of how really revolutionary in the most core ways the women's movement was mm -hmm. and has been in its strive for equality and how unrealistic it was to think that it wouldn't take a very long struggle mm -hmm. to really get these changes truly ingrained and accepted and also to build on them in ways that um, I think need to be and obviously one of the most distressing things with the the passage of years is both the income divide between the very wealthy and the poor and the poor still are comprised primarily of women and mm -hmm. their children mm -hmm. with a bigger bigger divide over time and secondly the fact that these big institutions that are so powerful and responsible for those who are the most powerful and the most wealthy have still been very hard for women to crack, although there are now more exceptions than there used to be. And they're requiring much more devotion to career than they did. Mm -hmm. Much more of a total immersion in your work life. And technology has only made that worse with blackberries, et cetera, so people are on call all the mm -hmm. time. So women's, the difficulty women have in balancing, as they, is a bad word, but in living up to the responsibilities of work and their family and their community, I fear have gotten harder in many respects. Now, that's not to say that women aren't looking for other routes and opening up their own businesses or their own practices or looking for um, alternative relationships with big employers. Mm -hmm. So there, there are signs of hope there, but I don't think we've made life really easier for men or women and the economy, the bigger trends of the economy, have made life much, much harder so, for both men and women. So much has been done, but much remains to. Indeed. Thank you so much. Welcome. <laughs>